So good evening, everyone. It is seven o'clock. We will be starting momentarily. Um, we're just going to wait about 30 seconds or so for folks to file on in from the waiting room. And I am also going to launch us live on Facebook. So uh, we will be starting um, in about 15 seconds. Uh, while we wait, um, for those who are comfortable doing so, uh, certainly no pressure, no obligation, but for those who are comfortable doing so, uh, let us know in the chat uh, where you're joining us from tonight. So let uh, Carolyn, Mary Lou, and myself know uh, where you're watching from tonight. And again, no, no pressure to uh, reveal your location, but uh, feel free. Feel free. <laughs> and uh, we will start in about uh, 10 seconds here. All right, wonderful. See, I'm seeing a lot of Tewksbury's and, and Lowell's in the chat, so that's great. And some surrounding communities as well, wonderful. And a few out-of-staters, that's great too. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so we're gonna get started. My name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, tonight's program is um, brought to you uh, by a partnership between the Tewksbury Library and the Pollard Memorial Library in Lowell. Uh, and the event is sponsored by the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library and the Pollard Memorial Library Foundation. I want to thank you for joining us tonight for a lecture on Tewksbury sculptor Miko Kaufman's storied career. Uh, before we get to the good stuff, just one of the you know, in a couple of things, uh, we are in webinar mode. So Mary Lou, Carolyn, and myself cannot see you or hear you. Uh, if you want to communicate, you want to do so via the Q&A and via the chat. Uh, we will take audience questions at the very end, but feel free to type them as they come to you. And I will relay those to Mary Lou and Carolyn um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, I anticipate the program lasting approximately an hour. This is a customized presentation that Mary Lou and Carolyn have never given before, but we think we'll go about an hour, including questions. Uh, I am recording tonight's presentation and I will be sending a link to the recording um, to uh, everyone who registered. So feel free to share that. Uh, additionally, we're streaming live on the Tewksbury Public Library's Facebook page. So feel free to like, comment and share on that video as well. And uh, you'll receive a link to the recording along with a link to a feedback survey uh, from me via email tomorrow morning. So keep an eye on your email, take 30 seconds, fill out that feedback survey, let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events at the library. And I will uh, share the results with Carolyn and Mary Lou and also with the Lowell Library. All right, so uh, really uh, looking forward to tonight's presentation. Uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, Mary Lou and Carolyn, and then I'm going to disappear for the night. Uh, I might resurface during the Q&A. Uh, so first, let me introduce Mary Lou. Uh, Mary Lou Sweat is an associate professor of art at Montserrat College of Art in Beverly, Mass, and she's a member of the Boston Sculptors Gallery. Uh, Mary Lou, who is a Greater Boston native, uh, lives and works in Jamaica Plain. She has exhibited throughout the United States in venues including the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, the Sculpture Center in Cleveland, Ohio, the Center of Contemporary Art in Seattle, Washington, and the Charles Westham Museum of Fine Art in Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, she's also, uh, her work has also been seen in uh, lots of uh, prominent outdoor venues including the Bridecliff Arts Colony in Woodstock, New York, the Chesterwood National Historic Site in Stockbridge, the Wentworth Coolidge Man Mansion Historic Site in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the Christian Science Center Plaza uh, in Boston. She has worked in several corporate, co corporate collections, including Bank of America, Fidelity Investments, Meditech Corporation, and New England Biolabs. She is the recipient of a first light award from the town of Brooklyn, a residency for iron casting at the Mary Hill Art Museum, a New England Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Sculpture, a Somerville Arts Council General Support Grant, and a Massachusetts Artists Foundation Studio Exchange Grant. So thank you so much, Mary Lou, for joining us tonight. And let me also introduce Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn Baganol is an associate, uh, is a retired associate professor of art, uh, also at uh, Montserrat uh, College of Art. And she is also a member of the Boston Sculpture Gallery. 
And Carol and I kind of short uh, shrimped a little bit on your bio. I do apologize, but Carolyn has exhibited nationally and internationally, including in New York, Chicago, London, England, and Cusco, Peru. Her work has been reviewed widely in Sculpture Magazine, the Boston Globe, Artscope, Art New England, Big Red, and Shiny, among other journals and newspapers. So all, let me do a check here. Oh, 63 of us watching live on Zoom and about a dozen of us watching live on Facebook. And I'm sure the hundreds that will watch after the fact on demand on YouTube, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mary Lou and Carolyn for joining us here tonight. And Mary Lou, you're up first, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Robert. And thank you so much for inviting us to investigate and talk on Miko Kaufman's work. Um, I'm going to start with a brief biography of Kaufman. He was a sculptor who immigrated to the US in 1951 and made his home in Tewksbury. He was born Avram Kaufman in 1924 to a Romanian father, Herman, and Adela Kupferberg from Moldova, which was then part of Romania. Uh, Kaufman attended high school until anti-Semitism worsened with fa fascism's rise in the 1930s. After the fall of France to Hitler, the new Romanian dictator Antonescu joined the Axis powers in 1940. Kaufman was recruited to forced labor by the military for several years. Um, most Jews in Romania survived the Allied bombings, but the Soviets invaded in 1944, ushering in Bolshevism. At his mother's urging, Kaufman left Romania in 1947 uh, crossing the Carpathians into Hungary and then Austria and finally into Italy. There he met Katja, who became his wife, and he studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Rome and then in Florence until he was able to come to the USA. Kaufman had three children. His marriage ended in divorce. Kaufman made freestanding sculpture in the round and designed medals for the Medallic Art Company. UMass Lowell awarded him an honorary doctorate in 2011. He received the James McNeil Whistler House Distinguished Artist Award in 2010 and the American Numismatic Society's Saltier Award in 1992. Many of Kaufman's works are in Tewksbury and Lowell and at Middlesex Community College Rolling Ridge Conference Center in North Andover. He was also a teacher and a member of the National Sculpture Association, the New England Sculpture Association, the Cambridge Art Association, and the Rockport Art Association. His medallic art includes presidential medals for George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, and Gerald R. Ford which are in the collection of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. Miko penned an autobiography uh, called A Chisler's True Story, which was published in 2014. Miko died in 2016 at the age of 92, leaving his longtime companion, Elsie Howell. So the first half of Kaufman's work was medallic art. Um, or what we would call medallions, which he created until 1985, after which he fully transitioned to large scale, what we call in the round sculpture. Um, he did this to challenge himself, feeling that he achieved what he wanted to with the medallions. So I'm gonna talk about the medallic sculpture and give you a little bit of history on what that looks like. Um, so what is medallic sculpture? There are three ways for art to be sculptural, low relief, high relief, and sculpture in the round. Medallic sculpture is low relief, like the coins in your pocket. And the first 14 slides I'm going to show you will show uh, a historic um, context for his work. Okay. High relief means flat on one side, but protruding from a background deeply, like this panel from the Parthenon in Athens of the fifth century BCE. See how the warrior and centaur are, are attached with most of the forms quite rounded and protruding into space, just the very rear 
part of the figure and the centaur are attached. That's called high relief. A more recent example of high relief and one that Kaufman may very well have been familiar with is um, the, the American uh, sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens Robert Gould Shaw Memorial of the 1880s. This gilt plaster original shows the Civil War soldier and his troops leaving Boston to fight in the South. St. Gaudens makes you feel that the troop density by layering his figures deeply in space. And I have a few details for you to see how deep that um, high relief is. And here he layers um, these really very fine portraits of the, the men in that troop um, in space so that you feel their presence. Okay, so some of the earliest relief sculpture uh, started with the Assyrians. Um, this is um, an Assyrian uh, relief that is in the British Museum. It is from the ninth century BCE, and it has a lot of detail, but it exists in a very shallow space, as you can see. This early medallic coin commemorates the killing of Julius Caesar by Brutus on the Ides of March in 44 BCE. The portrait of Brutus on the front or obverse side of the coin has um, uh, on its reverse or back, the images of the daggers used and a liberty cap. It also says Ides of March in Latin. 14 centuries later, you see we have this carving of Julius Caesar by the Italian Renaissance master Desiderio da Settignano. He carves the marble in very low relief. Kaufman may have seen his work while studying in Florence. He certainly would have seen this relief panel by Lorenzo Ghiberti, which was one of 28 New Testament panels he designed for the Florence Baptistery. This scene is the Annunciation. Here, Donatello with Brunelleschi carves the Madonna of the Clouds. Donatello was a student of Gilberti's and he pioneered the use of a very low relief, which is called Stiacciato in Italian. Here, to give the illusion of depth, the thickness gradually decreases from the foreground to the background in finely graded, flattened transitions. This technique was widely used by 15th and 16th century Italian sculptors and would have been seen by um, Kaufman in Florence. Uh, here is St. Gaudens again with a low relief medallion of the author Robert Louis Stevenson done in the late 19th century. And again, this is St. Gaudens' portrait of Charles Stuart Butler and Lawrence Smith Butler done in 1881. Very low relief. And he also studied in, in Rome. Um, and I discovered that St. Gaudens also designed um, a double eagle $20 gold coin, which was produced by the US Mint from 1907 to 1933. Um, Teddy Roosevelt asked St. Gaudens to um, enter the competition for this. Worth more than $20 today. Okay. On display at the Tewksbury Public Library is a complete set of the 192 medallions Kaufman made for America's bicentennial in 1974 for the Medallic Art Company. He uses a variety of approaches to design each one. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Here, the lessons of Stiacciato are well seen in this metal of old Ironsides with her stern protruding into space. Here too, the bison is clearly in the foreground of this scene of slaughter. Overlapping forms and graded thicknesses give depth to the scene. This beautifully designed metal plays on the circular shape of the coin itself with its repetition of curves, forming a harmonic whole of the subway scene. Cool.
Kaufman uses a series of diagonals to echo the chaotic movement of the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And for the Ford assembly line, repetition of the factory facade, windows, wheels, and figures underscores Ford's new manufacturing approach. This is a, um, a, the plaster cast of the, the medallion. Kaufman also specialized in portraiture for his medallic art, notably for his presidential inaugural medals. This is an example of low relief portraiture by Settignano, his Saint Helena. Kaufman's commemorative medallion of An Wang, the Chinese American computer engineer and founder of Wang Labs here in Boston, incorporates his portrait with a background depiction of magnetic core memory. Beautifully designed. Kaufman's Jimmy Carter design for a presidential medallion did not win, but th this was considered by many in the field to be the very best design and likeness. Here, his winning medallion um, in 1985 shows President Ronald Reagan paired with his vice president, George H.W. Bush. Here it's cast in bronze. And these presidential me medallions are part of the Smithsonian collection. George H.W. Bush's presidential medallion shown here in silver includes Bush's signature, which Kaufman much admired. He admired Bush in general. Um, and this is different for how, how sparse the background is as well. Moonwalk honors Michael Jackson and incorporates modernist ideas about design. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you can see how flat the figure is, how there's a pattern in the background that's repeated, um, which gives a sense of movement. Um, these ideas are seen in this example of Art Deco relief with its repetition of fluid forms paired with a simplified and flattened figure. So Kaufman was incorporating some of these ideas in his designs. His medallion for Elvis is more naturalistic, but still shows intentional flattening of form and simplification of details. The sculptor Henri Gaudier-Bredska, a French sculpture, sculptor working in England in the first part of the 20th century, shows two wrestling figures uh, whose forms are created to fit the rectangle, which is a tenant of modernism. Kaufman's youth, this is the obverse side, shows a young guitar player perfectly composed for the round metal, dynamic and simplified in bronze. Very stark, yet a, a satisfying sense of detail in it. The reverse of the same medallion has a soldier carrying a youth, a wounded comrade also against a blank background. This was done in 1973 and it shows the two different sides of youthful experience during the Vietnam War. This is an interesting approach by Kaufman uh, in his design for the National Medal of Technology in 1984. Um, he conceptualizes technology as energy bouncing off this man's palm, uh, the input and output of uh, technology for the National Medal. So it's more conceptual than some of his other work. And finally, Kaufman honored his heritage with a series of medals for the Judaic Heritage Society in 1975. This medal shows the Russian Jewish exodus and includes 
very good portraits of Brezhnev and Stalin on the left. This second example commemorates the Olympic massacre of the uh, Israeli Olympic team by Arab terrorists in Munich in 1972. So I think you can see the uh, range and breadth and depth of Kaufman's um, approach to design and how it shifted um, towards the middle of his career when then he shifted to more fully in the round work. Okay. We'll move it along to Caroline. And so Mary Lou, you have to stop sharing your screen at this point in order for yes. uh, Carolyn to share hers. Yes. Okay. So bear with us folks. I wanna give a big thumbs up to Carolyn and Mary Lou. Um, uh, at their college, they use Google Meet. So they were a little unfamiliar with how to present on Zoom and they actually attended a webinar to learn how to present on Zoom just so they could present to you tonight. So uh, we, we thank them for that. And uh, Carolyn, you're looking perfect right now. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, Kaufman's small figure studies and public sculpture. Um, particularly looking at the small figure studies that are in the Tewkesbury Library. So here we're looking at um, two pieces. The uh, study on the right is by Kaufman. And I will look at Kaufman's work in terms of its historical context and artistic style. In his formative years studying sculpture in Europe, Kaufman will have seen figurative sculpture in the prevailing style of the period, which had Art Deco influences. His small statuettes share strong stylistic elements with several Art Deco artists, particularly Pierre Le Faré and Max Le Verrier. As you can see in the following examples, these artists were fascinated by the body in motion and loved to explore athleticism. The figures are stylized with elongated limbs, dramatic and striking figural compositions with fluid and exaggerated movement. The figures are young and idealized, shown in the prime of life. I have paired Kaufman's small figure study improvisation on the right with Olympia by Max Levier and his small baseball players and hockey players with the javelin thrower, an athlete pushing a wheel and the hem Helmsman by Pierre Lafarge to give an idea of their shared artistic legacy. And again, you can see this emphasis on really dynamic movement and interest in the body in motion. And here we have the spirit of Marathon, also in the library by Kaufman which probably states this European and classical heritage the best. But what really distinguishes Kaufman's work um, and makes them unique is his emphasis on American life. While the Europeans looked back to classical sources, Kaufman uses this figurative tradition to explore uniquely American subject matter. Here we see golf players and in the next slide, racquetball and three dancing figures. But rather than showing classical dancers, Kaufman shows us a distinctive, distinctively American girl with a ponytail. Moving on to his public sculpture for probably what he's most known for, um, he has said, if you should notice one of my public sculptures, I would like you to stop and ponder on its subject. The pause might refresh, inform, and even inspire. My work reflects on the bonds that substantiate our humanity. And I think you can really see how he, um, his work does substantiate our humanity. This is a homage to women in Lowell and possibly his best known work, I don't know. 
Um, but it commemorates the, the Mill Girls. And Kaufman has written, although this sculpture was inspired by the Mill Girls of the Industrial Revolution, it easily identifies with the struggles and aspirations of working women everywhere. The figures represent women of different races and celebrate the contributions made by women throughout time. Women all over the world have one trait in common. They work, they work hard, and their work is unheralded. The sculpture is characterized by an extremely dynamic composition. Kaufman's ability to show movement is exemplified in this sculpture. Compositionally, he uses sharp diagonal lines in opposing directions to give the piece a striking contrast of opposing forces. The mill girl's arms push forward and upward, the unstable diagonal base, which you can see in these slides, emphasizes their struggle. Their long skirts are not fluid drapery, but heavy and confining. The figures are simplified and universalized. Again, Kaufman exaggerates the figure, elongating the body and limbs while creating dramatic angular rhythms. In terms of style, Kaufman's work bears some similarities to the work of an earlier generation of modernist European sculptors, particularly Wilhelm Lembruck. I'm not suggesting that um, Kaufman necessarily saw Lembruck's work, but there are stylistic um, relationships. Probably, you know, um, he may have seen him or they were just in the air. Um, Lembrook's work is very expressive, distinctively modernist, very simplified, elongated figure, again with angular limbs. And I think both Kaufman and Lembrook share this kind of expressive sensibility. This is the muster. Um, and like his other work, I'll just go forwards to show you the, I'm afraid this was taken from a photograph in the library and it doesn't do it justice, but I do have some details. Um, true to his other work, the muster is an extremely dynamic composition showing a group of firemen wrestling with a fire hose. This sculpture is both heroic and whimsical which is an unusual combination. Unlike Homage to Women, the muster shows Kaufman's realism, and you can really see that in some of the details of this sculpture. This is um, showing a, a more close up of the treatment of the fireman looking up. And here you can really see the dynamism and really almost playful, extreme. Uh, positions of the figures in this uh, sculpture. And as I said, both heroic and somewhat playful and whimsical. This is Touching Souls across the street. Um, Kaufman's sculpture for the United Methodist Church in Tewkesbury. Um, a copy of this same sculpture is installed in Tewkesbury Abbey in England. And like his other work, Kaufman depicts a mixed race group showing his sensitivity, his strong social commitment and progressive values. Moving on, this will be the last of his um, monumental pieces that I'll talk about. This is the Wamaset Indian. And the, this sculpture honors the Wamaset village of the Penacook tribe located in what is now Lowell and extending into what is now Tewkesbury. Elsie Howell, Kaufman's companion, worked as a nurse with the Navajo Nation and helped to secure much of the initial funding for this sculpture. And when it was unveiled in 1989, Deacon Daniel Martin of the Navajo tribe officiated over a blessing ceremony. Every year since, a smudging ritual has been performed to bless the sculpture and protect it from evil. With changing ideas of representation and an evolving understanding of how indigenous people are portrayed, I think that this sculpture could become somewhat problematic or questions could be raised about the depiction 
of a Native American, um, possibly, I don't know. But I would like to say that the one thing that uh, Kaufman really emphasized in his big message is that art should be part of everyday life. And in that, I think he succeeded admirably and enriched all of our lives. Great. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Mary Lou. We made great time. We, uh, we went uh, 30 minutes there. Um, so a few things I just wanted to mention. Oh, let me turn my screen on. Uh, before we get to Q&A, um, uh, I did want uh, to um, note the fact that um, uh, Miko's trust, um, and I'm probably using the wrong word, but uh, donated or loaned um, lots of uh, his work to the library. Uh, we have two of our display cases in our lobby uh, filled with uh, miniatures. We also have um, uh, probably around 100 of his medals um, uh, upstairs uh, on the second floor on the, on the walls. Um, and uh, in addition to all that, uh, a local realtor uh, recently um, donated some really wonderful high resolution photos of all of Miko's uh, statues. Um, and those are also framed and up on the second floor. And uh, in addition, um, within the next couple of months, uh, once we're sort of fully open, uh, we uh, do plan on doing some sort of, um, sort of like a, I'm not sure, like a guided, a self-guided tour of all of Miko's artwork that we, we have. So, so look for news on that uh, in the coming weeks, but, but I did wanna mention that. Okay. Uh, also, I had a few comments uh, from a, from just one attendee. So I'm 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 imagining. It, hopefully, it wasn't um, didn't represent more than just more than one. But um, uh, ho hopefully, folks um, saw a screen that was about eighty percent of the slideshow and about twenty percent of the presenter. Uh, the presenter should have been in a small box to the right. And then you should have been looking about 80% of the screen would have been the image. So uh, if you didn't get that for whatever reason, you will get it on the recording and also on our Facebook page. Okay, let's get to some questions here. Uh, first question comes from Carrie. Girls Inc. of Lowell has a Kaufman medallion for our annual celebration of today's women. How or where could we have a, a, a medallion cast for this year's award? Um, so obviously, uh, Miko passed away several years ago. Um, anyone in the greater Lowell area, Mary Lou or Carolyn, that you would recommend? To cast a medal, uh, somebody would have to design it. Um, you could contact a foundry to see if they would do that. Um, or look up, um, I would look up the medallions. Um, yeah, is there a society? Uh, that... A new American Numismatic Society. So they might have some information. Uh, Jack would like to know uh, who sculpted the statue of Ann Sullivan and Helen Keller near Town Hall? That is oh, that Miko. Miko Kaufman. Yes, mm -hmm. that's, um, that's Cold Water. And yes, that was um, by Miko Kaufman. Uh, yeah, definitely one of his better known statues, that's for sure. Uh, Jeanette, what, and Jeanette, who's a member of the Tewksbury Community of Artists, would like to know, is there a way for the public to browse any of Miko's artwork that is available for sale? Um, there may be someone on the line that can answer that, but uh, mm -hmm. Carolyn or Mary Lou, do you have any idea? Well, because Caroline and I were not very familiar with his work, we've been doing a lot of online research, and yes, things will come up for sale. So they cer uh, you certainly can do a web search on using his name and you'll find some venues. Let's see. So folks, uh, we've answered three questions. Um, we have about 70 people on Zoom and another 15 or so on Facebook. Anyone have any additional questions? Yeah, Susan would like to know, what can you tell us about any international sculptures by Miko Kaufman? Well, he has the he has a piece in uh, Paris, um, and he has a piece in England. Those are the two that I know of. I think it's Debussy, a uh, sculpture of Debussy that is in Paris, and then Touching Souls in Tewkesbury in England. Those are the two international pieces that I know of. 
and, and Carolyn mentioned that uh, that's that's correct. Uh, it's uh, it's our it's our unofficial sister community. I guess there's a little bit of uh, controversy around that. We 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 did it. We did a talk on Tewksbury, England, a few months ago. But uh, but yes, uh, Miko has a statue over in Tewksbury, England. Yeah. Uh, Gail mentions that he uh, also has a piece in Marathon, Greece. Oh right, it, I wonder if it's the piece that the miniature is in the library. Oh, that could be. Uh, yeah, in, in addition, we have, um, I believe, three miniatures in our browsing wing, in our Fairgrieve wing, uh, and I believe that is one of them. Yes. Uh, Lynn has a, another question. Uh, didn't Miko also do Olympic medals as well? I haven't seen any information about that. I mean, there was the, the one example that I showed of the um, the massacre of the Israeli team uh, in Munich. Um, I didn't, I haven't, I haven't come across any more information about that. And Mary Lou and Carolyn uh, read um, at least parts of uh, Miko's autobiography that he wrote a few years ago. Um, so they, they did their best to learn as much as possible about Miko in a, in a six week period. So we appreciate that. Uh, in the comments, Heidi says that he also has sculptures in Spain. And Patricia says that the marathon piece is also in Holliston, Massachusetts. Uh, Janet has a question. Is the Debussy sculpture at UMass Lowell also by Miko Kaufman? Yes, 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 it is. Yes, and there's a copy in UMass, that there's the, the one here and there's also the one in uh, Paris, yes. Uh, Deborah asks, will there be a publication made regarding his work? And so to my knowledge, and, and maybe Caroline and Mary Lou can correct me, but I believe that Miko's own autobiography is the only book ever published um, solely about Miko. And uh, the library does have multiple copies. And I will try to find a link to the book in our catalog. And I will put that in the chat. Um, to your knowledge, were there any other books uh, written about Miko? No, no, but I believe that um, a student at Lowell um, did a um, very thorough catalog resume and um, maybe have, has written a, and worked with, with Miko. And I, I assume that that would be somewhere on file in the university. I, I, I had thought of trying to track it down, but actually I didn't have the time. But um, I, I imagine that is a very, I think it was a, um, maybe in a master's project or, a, a, I'm not sure exactly what the project was, but I know a very thorough catalog resume was made. And um, I assume that that might be available. Uh, so in the chat, I just attempted to, uh, let me see here, put the catalog link. Uh, the name of his autobiography is called uh, A Chiseler's True Story, The Art of Miko Kaufman. And um, I'm going to put that, it uh, looks like the library currently owns three copies. I think we actually have a fourth as well. And... It's not letting me put it in the chat, but I will include that information in the email I send tomorrow. All right, now the questions are pouring in. Uh, Martha says that uh, his estate is also selling some of Miko's works. That would make sense. Um, Heidi says that um, the uh, debut, uh, let me see, the marathon piece in Holliston is at the beginning of the Boston Marathon route. Um, that, that would make sense. Uh, Heidi has a comment. Thank you so much for doing this. I had the privilege of traveling to France with Miko, Elsie, and my mother for the unveiling of Claude Debussy. Uh, it is wonderful to help people know about this fine man. He was not only a great artist, but a true gentleman. Thank you, Heidi. Wonderful. Uh, so I think I answered Deborah's question um, about the autobiography, and I'll include information in the email tomorrow. An anonymous attendee says, "What part of Tewksbury did he live on? Did he live uh, on Pike Street? Someone has a huge, large statue rooster on their lawn. Um, his making or where he lived, perhaps? Um, do we know? I'm sure people in the chat know. Carolyn and Mary Lou, do you happen to know where in Tewksbury um, he lived?" Marilu might know. I, I could look it up. I don't know offhand. 
Yeah, we'll just go to the chat. Heidi says North Tewksbury. Patricia says right off of North Street. Okay. Okay. So that solves that. There we go. We can crowdsource answers. We're all Miko Kaufman ex experts here. Uh, yes, Elsie Howell is still with us. She was just in the library a few months ago to uh, look at the um, Miko Kaufman displays that we've put up. So uh, she is, she is, not only is she with, still with us, but um, she is uh, quite a lady. Uh, let's see, Virginia has a comment. I am embarrassed to say I had not heard of Miko until recently but I am excited to get to know some of his work in person when it is safe to do so again. Uh, many thanks for this program. Uh, thank you, Virginia. And uh, Virginia, I can say, I, I, I don't think I'll get in trouble, uh, that we are expanding our hours and we'll be basically back to normal hours in less than two weeks, uh, the first Monday in April. So Monday, April 5th, we will be open 10 to 8, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 10 to 5, Thursday, Friday, and then uh, 9 to 1 on Saturdays. So we are expanding our hours. Obviously, social distancing, mask wearing, hand sanitizing, all that stuff remains in place. Um, I, I, I could say that um, you can always go and visit the outdoor pieces safely. Yes. And um, Marilu and I um, had never been to Tukes, well, I'd never been to Tukesbury before and neither had Marilu, and we had fun. I mean, it was deep snow, but we explored um, as much as we could see and really enjoyed visiting um, Miko's outdoor work. And uh, it's always there, available, it's fabulous. It's part of life. That's right. I have a, a field trip plan to go back to Lowell to see the um, his, uh, mill workers. Um, uh, specifically, uh, Marion Street is where he lived, and uh, so right off of North Street, uh, the Marion Street. Um, Kathleen has a question. Uh, it's sort of a she's she's it's more of a fact. Did you know um, that Miko had small groups of Girl Scouts at his house and showed them how to sculpt with clay, and Elsie would give them girls homemade cookies. So uh, there you <laughs> That's go. Wonderful. That does seem like uh, the true gentleman that he was. Uh, Gail says, Elsie is amazed. You have given a wonderful presentation. So I believe Elsie Howell uh, may be watching Carolyn and Mary Lou. Fabulous. Wonderful. wonderful. Um, and a, a anonymous attendee says, fabulous artwork and great lecture. Thank you. Uh, I, oh, you know, I should have thanked the Tewksbury Historical Society for helping promote this event to their members. And their president, Doug Sears, asks, any comments on his extensive sculptures of molten plastic? It was, I found it very hard to get much information. There is some information in his autobiography, um, but it, the uh, images were not very clear. So it's hard to get a sense of, uh, he self-describes being just, in love with the medium and, and its immediacy, because it, you're working with it as, as it cools. Um, and they the work tended to be more, ab, you know, completely abstract. So um, I'm not sure it's his strongest work. Uh, Paige says, uh, Paige Impink, who's a library trustee, uh, new town crier news reporter, and wonderful debate moderator, uh, says that Tewksbury also has an ode to Miko on Route 133 on our switch box done by Tewksbury resident and artist Brett uh, Weiss, and uh, that is located across from Ames Pond. We have some really cool switch box art uh, here in Tewksbury. There's actually one uh, right near the um, uh, senior center um, down about uh, two minutes from here. Um, but anyway, there's one uh, specifically dedicated to Miko and his work on Route 133 across from Ames Pond. So thank you for pointing that out, Paige. Um, yes, uh, more folks saying Marion Street. We got it. We got it. Barbara Flanagan of the famous Flanagan family uh, says there's a large Debussy uh, well and interestingly lighted at the night, uh, at night. Uh, at the center of a tiny park on Broadway in Lowell near the Worthen Art House. 
so thank you for that, Barbara. And Barbara also notes that um, Miko had an open house years ago as a fundraiser for the Tewksbury Garden Club, and he was very charming and informative. Thank you, Barbara. Um, a anonymous attendee says, "Where is the where's the where is the best place to find a list and catalog of his work, uh, especially his outdoor work?" Well, I would I would think the. Um... And I don't know how, whether you can access this, but I do know that um, a student at Lowell did a very thorough um, catalog resume of all his work with him. Um, and I could look that up. I mean, I, I did come across that in my research. So I assume it would be, I, I don't know whether it was a master's thesis or exactly what the, um, it might've been. I, I can look that up. Well, Carolyn, Mary, uh, I do have email addresses for everyone who registered and I won't spam them. But if you do come up with an answer to that, if we have a definitive list of all his uh, yeah. public art, you know, his, his outdoor sculptures, especially, uh, I would love to pass that along to the group. Yeah. Um, Martha mentions that he was an artist in residence with the UMass Lowell Plastics Department. And um, Martha also added that Whistler uh, by Miko is located at the Whistler house. Right, yes. And uh, we have Jack in the comments saying there's more than life-size sculptures of James McNeil Whistler at the Whistler Home Museum in Lowell. And uh, it is only about two blocks from the homage to women. So thank you, Jack, for the, the follow-up there. Uh, Donna, who had to leave, uh, says, thank you, well done. Whew, well, we've answered about 27 minutes, uh, 27 uh, questions or so in about uh, 17 minutes here. Um, Doug wants to know what happened to his Indian maiden sculpture? Uh, I don't know. He, it, there is an image of it in his autobiography, but I, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't list where it is. So it, it, this does not have a comprehensive listing of his, all of his work. I'm also taking notes. I'm recording this. I'll, I'll take notes of the questions we don't, we don't have answers to and see what I can do. Our assistant director, Noelle Bach, who um, put together all the displays, uh, she's become a bit of an expert on Miko. And uh, I'll see uh, if she knows the questions to any of these, sorry, the answers to any of these uh, questions. Uh, Janet says, where can we get, where can we see his sculpture of James Francis? Francis. Not sure about that one either. Uh, Carrie says that the Indian uh, maiden uh, has not been placed yet. Oh. So that's according to Carrie. Uh, Doug says that he has a miniature of the Indian maiden sculpture. Very cool, Doug. All right, so last call for questions before we wrap. We made really good time. Um, we had a 30 minute presentation. We were able to get through 20 to 30 questions here. Um, ah, Elsie says that the Indian maiden sculpture will be placed along the Merrimack River, hopefully this fall, 2021. Hey, I think we just made some news guys. Gail, thank you. Uh, th please thank Elsie for that information. So that solves that. Um, mystery. Uh, Terry says uh, the handmaiden was given to Lowell and will be installed along the Merrimack River. Okay. Terry knew as well. Uh, Jack says there is a small sculpture of James Francis at the Whistler house. All right. All right. So I think we will wind down. I'll give folks a few, couple more minutes to uh, ask questions. But in the meantime, uh, Mary Lou and Carolyn, let me ask you a question. Uh, before we wrap up, what was the most surprising thing you learned about Miko Kaufman during your uh, six weeks of research? Well, I would have to say the, the, his medallion, of course, that's what I researched, but they are really quite beautiful and varied. And I, and technically wonderful. So, I really enjoyed getting to know that aspect of his work. I mean, I agree. I, Mary Lou and I spent a lot of time looking and photographing the medallions and I got totally drawn into them as well. 
But I have to say, I really enjoy uh, seeing public art and I love um, his whole idea that art should be part of daily life. I love his celebration of labor, um, you know, the firemen, the mill um, girls. I love it when art is integrated into everyday life and celebrates everybody, ordinary people, workers, and the history of a community. And I think he really, uh, that, that was a fabulous gift. And for me, it was a real discovery. I had never really never been to Tewkesbury before. So it was fabulous to see it. Oh, and I will add about, I, I totally agree with Caroline too. And I would add that it yeah, does astound me that he came here um, under a difficult situation of, you know, being in forced labor camps and uh, being a Romanian and took on, you could tell the love that shines through his design, but especially the bicentennial coinage. There's such varied uh, subject matter that he chose and um, some very surprising like the massacre of the bison. Um, and I, I, it is astounding to think how much he embraced American history through that. Yeah, and uh, Amer even though the, all the, um, the sports, I mean, it, they're very playful, they're wonderful. Uh, the little um, it was a big, small figures. Really, yeah, and uh, Amer even though the, all the, um, the sports, I mean, it, they're very playful. They're so sorry about the feedback you were getting. <laughs> I was checking to see if there were any uh, Facebook questions and I didn't mute myself. I apologize. Uh, no questions on Facebook. Uh, we're going to wind down. Carlene wants to know, do you know where his Eugene, De oh boy, De Mazenod works are? No. Yeah, those, those were commissions. Mm -hmm. That was a commission. Um, By the um, Priory, where he, okay, I'm thumbing through the book. All right, well, you, well, you check the book. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, great to have such a talented person living in this town. I will have to really spend some time admiring his artwork at the library. Uh, excellent, excellent. Elsie says, thank you. You did him proud. Miko loved Tewksbury. Oh, that's wonderful, Gail. And tell tell Elsie obviously that uh, Tewksbury loved Miko. Uh, Heidi says he also has some pieces at the Smithsonian. Patricia says that uh, Judy Buswick of Chumsford uh, wrote several articles articles about Miko uh, for the Arts Around Boston magazine several decades ago. Jane says our town is so lucky to have had Miko Kaufman as a member of our community, and he was always approachable and um, left a wonderful legacy of public sculptures. Uh, well put, Jane. Uh, I did finally figure out how to put that. That funny link in the chat is the link to our online library catalog to request a copy um, of Miko's autobiography. So I did uh, figure that out. Um, Mary Lou, any luck? Yes, um, it was a commission um, by the St. Joseph the Worker Shrine um, from the Order of the Mary Immaculate in Lowell, Mass. And that's where it is. So Wonderful. One of his first um, figurative commissions. Well, so, when, El when Elsie Howell says, thank you, you did him proud, Miko loved Tewksbury, it's probably a good place to stop as we come up on eight o'clock. So um, Mary Lou and Carolyn, wanted to give you an opportunity. Any last words you want to say to the audience before we wrap up? I'd like to just... Um really say how wonderful this um, opportunity has been for me and I've discovered more about this area that I didn't know and an artist who I just really have enjoyed learning more about and hope to know more about in the future. I, I can only echo what Caroline just said. It's been a pleasure. All right well next time you're here um... Uh, Donna's Donuts is on me, guys. Okay, so uh, look look forward to uh, to seeing you guys around, hopefully, 
And I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, check, please check your email tomorrow morning with a link to the feedback survey, a link to this recording. And uh, please share this video with, uh, with family and friends, especially folks who live in Tewksbury or perhaps used to live in Tewksbury. Uh, really want to get the word out and sort of um, you know, um, you know, make this part of the tribute to, to Miko uh, that we're working on here at the library. So thank you all and everyone have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.